Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. Occasionally, we delve into academia, and tonight we're going to delve into academia for our feature. Vincent Scully, not Vince Scully the broadcaster, but Vincent Scully, the Yale professor who taught architecture at Yale for 61 years. Vincent Scully died recently at the age of 97, and it's safe to say he was one of the legendary teachers of the 20th century. In fact, he made the cover of Time magazine in 1966. His architecture class at Yale was liberally interspersed with art history. And my friend Jim Munson, who attended the class, said it literally changed many people's lives and futures. And judging by the number of people who attended his classes over the years, easily in the thousands, I'm sure that's true. According to the Washington Post, for Vincent Scully, architecture wasn't just about buildings. In more than six decades as a Yale University professor, he became known as the foremost architectural historian of his time and exerted a profound influence in how the wider public understands the purpose of architecture. Even though Dr. Scully was not a trained architect, dozens of renowned architects studied with him, prompting one of the field's elder statesmen, Philip Johnson, to call him the most influential architecture teacher ever. In more than a dozen books and thousands of lectures that were an awe-inspiring form of performance art, Dr. Scully sought to impart several central ideas that buildings help define a culture, that architecture should be a humanizing force, and that a well-built community can foster a well-lived life. Hardly a cloistered academic, Dr. Scully influenced the ideas of people as varied as historian David McCulloch, designer Maya Lin, who designed the Vietnam Memorial, and thousands of urban planners around the world. He helped popularize the historic preservation movement and was the spiritual father of new urbanism, a school of design that promotes architecture on a human scale by, in effect, looking toward the past to build the future. Dr. Scully began teaching at Yale in 1947. Before long, his introductory course in art history was so popular that it had to be moved to the law school, which had the only lecture hall large enough to accommodate as many as 400 students at a time. He included architecture as a component of art history, along with painting and sculpture. The lights were lowered in the hall at 11.30 a.m. when Dr. Scully began his lecture, accompanied by photographic slides. Inevitably, students dubbed the class Darkness at Noon. Dr. Scully, who considered his lectures his greatest achievement, spent a full day preparing for each class, even late into his career. He was featured on the cover of Time magazine in 1966 as one of the country's finest college teachers and was later profiled in The New Yorker. Well, there are a number of his lectures on YouTube, on the internet, like we have to do with our songs, we have to cut it short in the interest of time. But here's a little bit of one of his lectures late in life. And intermingled in the middle are some testimonials from some of his students. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I see so many old friends here, and I feel thoroughly undone. I have no idea if I'll be able to pull myself together and say something coherent in the next 50 minutes. I did want to start by saying that I've been teaching at Yale for many years. I like this class the best. I really do. I've enjoyed it the most. And you've given me more back, more than you know. Of course, I said exactly the same thing to the class last year. <laughs> but I meant it. I meant it then, and I mean it now. I think somehow these last few years, whatever our ages, it's been very necessary for us to grow, and to see the inexhaustibility of things, especially the wonderful inexhaustibility of meaning in art. I have been his student since 1960. I took his course, HA 53B. I can't remember how many times. It wasn't that I flunked. I just went back and took it over and over again. We took both the History of Art course and the History of Modern Architecture course, one in the fall, one in the spring. And then my sophomore year, I took it again. And my junior year, I took it again. And my senior year, I took it again. Most of us have had the experience of books that change your life. His lectures changed lives, and not just people who were going to be architects. You felt as if you had some brand new insight after every lecture. All of those people who went and took his course remember to today, for the rest of their lives, the things that have opened their minds to many different, different types of, uh, of thinking. The course runs from prehistoric cave painting to Michelangelo. And we have a complete change in the human attitude toward the divine and what's important for art. Now, for Michelangelo, not the animal body, it's the human body, considered divine. 
Michelangelo himself is called divine. Piero della Francesca in the 15th century, remember, called perspective divine. But Michelangelo, the man, was called divine in his own lifetime. Well, we're going to move on now to Gianni Halliday, who died recently at the age of 74. The biggest rock star you never heard of. And the reason you've probably never heard of him is that he was the greatest rock star in France, but he never entered the American market, even though he was known as the French Elvis. He sold over 100 million records worldwide, and he was an icon in France. In fact, at his funeral, over a million people gathered on the Champs-Élysées to watch his funeral procession. His career spanned 57 years, and here's Matthew Bannister from the BBC4 Last Word on Johnny Halliday. Johnny Halliday was an iconic star in his native France. He sold more than 100 million records and once performed to a million people in a cavalcade down the Champs-Élysées in Paris. He appeared on the cover of Paris Match magazine 60 times, more than any other Frenchman. In the early days, his sexually charged stage performances caused a sensation, delighting fans and outraging the establishment. He grew old disgracefully, enjoying the sex, drugs and rock and roll lifestyle to the full. The French writer and cultural commentator Muriel Zaga. He was such an enormous presence. It's perhaps hard to imagine from a British point of view just how large he loomed. Millions of people bought his records. But yeah. I never did this to be a star, I did this to, to do a living. And uh, life decided differently. He was part of a, a wave of baby boomer pop stars in the late 50s, early 60s, which came to be referred to as the Ye Ye. Johnny! Perhaps what made his name at the time was a, was a film. There was a film called D'où viens tu Johnny? Where did you come from, Johnny? Which was a sort of biopic, really, of him as a very young emerging pop star. He started off with fascination with Elvis and a lo lifelong fascination with Nashville and that sort of scene. That's all right, mama. Well, that's all right for you. That's all right. He was never a countercultural figure. He was really always more about meat and potatoes, American music. He started out as a clean cut young rocker and then gradually became more and more encased in black leather with age, interestingly, you know, run the other way around. Nothing highbrow about him. Really someone who appealed to la France profonde, you know, middle France. <laughs> Also, was a gateway for French people who don't speak English to Anglo-Saxon music, for people who wouldn't necessarily have enjoyed the originals as much as they enjoyed a sort of French filtered version of Elvis's songs, of Beatles songs, even Rolling Stones song. He did a cover of Honky Tonk Woman, which is called La Femme Honky Tonk. <laughs> So he did sort of enable a lot of French people, millions of French people, to relate to a culture that they found fascinating, but that remained close to them for linguistic reasons. There are songs that were written specifically for him later on in the 1980s, 1990s, that I think will last perhaps longer than the cover versions. Michel Berger, who's a very distinguished French songwriter, wrote a couple of songs for him, including one called Quelque chose de Tennessee, which is surprisingly a song about Tennessee Williams. But that's very French to have pop songs about Tennessee Williams, Ella Fitzgerald, Cézanne, Proust. He also lived a, a rock and roll lifestyle to the full. So I think there were four marriages, a very complicated love life, but also battles with addiction. For many years, he had needed cocaine to fuel his performances. You know, he, he did a lot of touring, performing to millions of people. To a ripe old age, it's very significant that he celebrated his 70th birthday on stage. So not someone who slowed down very much. Mm -hmm. 
Hey Joe, cours pas comme ça. Dis, y a pas le feu chez toi. The question of whether he is important in, in musical history at large is one that will be asked even in France, uh, you know, because he didn't translate to the foreign market, he never broke America. I'm, I'm not sure that it's the right way of looking at him. I think perhaps you have to reverse your point of view and really look at him as a, as a French property, as a, as a French icon by and for uh, the French. I remember interviewing a, a French music journalist a few years ago who said to me, Tant qu'on a Johnny, la France bande encore, which I will translate delicately as, while Johnny is with us, French sexual potency remains intact. Which sounds like a joke and was a joke, but I think also expresses something profound. The music of Johnny Alliday, who's died aged 74. Well, by way of introduction to our final subject tonight, there's this. The crowd in Yankee Stadium for the final game of the year is here to cheer not the Yankees, but Roger Maris, who comes through with his 61st homer for a new baseball record. It's a qualified record, however. Babe Ruth set his 1927 record of 60 homers in a shorter season of 154 games. And it took Roger four more games to hit 60 and 162 games to hit 61. The baseball commissioner has ruled that Ruth's record stands until someone hits 61 in the same number of games. That ruling does nothing to dull the roar of the crowd today. They won't let Roger alone until he comes out of the dugout and takes a bow. The newest Sultan of Squat, Roger has set a record that will probably stand for many years. Well, our subject isn't Roger Maris, who died over 30 years ago, but the guy whose name you didn't hear there, and that was the pitcher, Tracy Stallard, who died recently at the age of 80. Even though, by all measures, Tracy Stallard turned out to be a journeyman pitcher, he had a lifetime ERA over four, he lost almost twice as many games as he won. He's immortalized in baseball history for that afternoon. Tracy Stowe was in his first full season with the Boston Red Sox. He was pitching on the last day of the season. Game didn't mean anything except for Roger Maris's pursuit of Babe Ruth. And it was the fourth inning. He had a 2-0 count on Maris, and he challenged him with a fastball. Here's Scooter Rizzuto on the call, October 1st, 1961. Wind up. Fastball hit, hit, hit. There it was, immortality for Tracy Stallard. Maris had been chasing Ruth all season with Mickey Mantle right there also. Mantle was plagued by injuries late in the season and wound up with 54 home runs. But Maris played through and broke the record, and it took him many years for them to remove that silly asterisk stuff. It was put in by Fort Frick, who was a ghostwriter for Babe Ruth, by the way. And so Tracy Stallard became one of the great trivia questions in baseball history. Ironically, that game turned out to be one of the best that Tracy Stallard ever pitched. Pitched seven innings, only gave up five hits, and the Red Sox lost one to nothing. And that was sort of the story of Tracy Stellard's career. He went on to pitch for the Cardinals and the Mets in the National League. It turns out that when he was with the Mets, he was also the losing pitcher in another famously pitched game. Stellard was the Mets starter on Father's Day of 1964 when they were facing the Phillies. And Jim Bunning came out and threw the famous Father's Day perfect game which we talked about when we did the Jim Bunning podcast. I refer you to that one. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Tapps. To his credit, Tracy Starr was never bitter about giving up that home run. And in fact, later in life, he became friends with Roger Maris, who was a good guy in his own right. Tracy Starr used to tell interviewers if it wasn't for Roger Maris, no one would have ever known his name. So to close and honor Tracy Starr, we're going to do a Bob Dylan song as sung by George Harrison, If Not For You. <laughs> Not for